This is Yester's Eve, where we look back at things that were, and point out they were different back then. We take an old games magazine and play the games they thought were the best and worst, usually discovering something at least slightly non-tedious along the way. Today we visit a new machine, the innovative 3DO. Marketed like very few games consoles before or since, and backed by some of the most famous people and companies in the industry. So why is there a fair chance you've never heard of it? The magazine is Paragon's imaginatively named 3DO magazine. In our case, we're picking issue 12, where, as the machine declined, there were only two games to review, giving us a very easy decision for our gaming heaven and hell. And if I tell you the two games are called Olympic Soccer and Iron Angel of the Apocalypse The Return, it may be fairly obvious which the duffer is going to be. There's more to look at here though, because along with the machine in decline, you do of course have a magazine in decline. For all the troubles the magazine industry has today, you don't normally know if a magazine is on the verge of closure. They're just there one minute and the next you find the publisher has closed it and helpfully transferred your subscription to Fly Fishing and Nazi Trains Monthly. We lost both Games Master and Games TM in late 2018, for instance, but in both cases you'd never have known. Games Master's penultimate issue was still 100 pages, and editor Robin Valentine was writing his goodbyes, thinking, with plenty of justification, that he was leaving the magazine much stronger than when he arrived. The next month opens with new editor Ian Everden informing readers that this, the 336th issue of Games Master, would be the final one. Games TM was still a 116-page magazine when it closed the same month after 206 issues. But back in the 90s you could tell. By the time it disappeared, as late as mid-1995, Future's first computing magazine, Amstrad Action, had become a 24-page pamphlet, but still costing and expensive for the time £3.25. Amiga Power suffered the same fate, declining to 50 A4 pages by the time of the Viking funeral issue. You may have noticed this show refers to the plug at the end of the episode as the back page advert. That was, for fairly obvious reasons, generally the most expensive page of advertising in a magazine, and a magazine being unable to sell it, as AA couldn't for some months, was usually a very bad sign. Amiga Power went further, publishing an advert for an entirely fictional energy drink for several months before the publisher noticed. And so we land here, a year into the run of 3DO magazine. The magazine only gave you 36 pages for your £6 outlay, padding out its run with some lengthy play guides, a letters page that must have included one from every reader, and that staple of cheap magazine making, The Buyer's Guide. It also came with an at this point increasingly desperate demo disc. Issue 12s contained only a one-level demo of the 3DO port of Syndicate, an excellent but three-year-old Amiga game by Populous and theme park developers Bullfrog. The 3DO version would turn out well, but fundamentally this was still a game that Amiga owners had paid 20 quid less for some time before there even was a 3DO. The magazine staggered on for three more issues that seemed largely lost to time, losing its cover disc for the last couple, presumably because there was literally nothing left to include on it, but the writing was certainly on the wall by issue 12. The story of how we got here is also the story of the 3DO itself, so we'll save that for the cover feature. This is one of those yester scenes when the story is more interesting than the games. But with that said, here's Olympic Soccer. Issue 12 of 3DO Magazine probably has fewer words in it than this script does, but it has a surprising number of interesting game stories, and here's another one. Olympic Soccer is by a studio called Silicon Dreams that almost no one remembers. They begun, in 1994, as the newly formed in-house development team for famous 8- and 16-bit publishers US Gold, who themselves were originally formed to import the best of the American game scene for the UK market. They were the importer for early microprose games like Silent Service and F-15 Strike Eagle. They brought Sega games like OutRun and eSWAT to home computer users in the UK. Without them, we might not have got to play the early LucasArts games like Loom and Monkey Island. The categories Microprose, LucasArts, and Sega Arcade conversions pretty much accounts for half my childhood. They also diversified into bringing us some of the more interesting European and Japanese games, Cruise for a Corpse and the computer version of Street Fighter 2 being two of the more famous examples. Every Amiga owner knew their name, and if they didn't, they certainly knew their budget label Kicks, the final resting place of much early 90s pocket money. But what they didn't have was their ability to do their own stuff entirely in-house, 
and that was why they founded Silicon Dreams. The studio's ties to their parent were short-lived though. This and the accompanying Olympic Games license were their only two releases for US Gold before the latter was sold to IDOS in 1996. Company founder Jeff Brown brought the development team back and ran it for a further seven years, mostly producing forgettable football titles in a world increasingly dominated by the twin titans of FIFA and Pro Evolution Soccer. This predates all that. Pro Evo didn't yet exist and FIFA was but two games old, albeit with a well-regarded version already released on the 3DO. However, FIFA 96 had predictably passed the ailing machine by and people were looking for something new. With a unique hook of a license, Olympic Soccer had a chance. Olympic Soccer comes from the period late in the 3DO's life where Panasonic were trying to protect their investment. More on that later. They'd stepped up and helped publish several games, of which this was one. It wasn't a 3DO exclusive though, getting releases for PlayStation, Saturn and PC as well. I assume the US Gold Sports logo at the start was the start of an attempt to build a rival EA Sports style brand. Given this is one of the last couple of US Gold releases, it clearly didn't work. The intro though, there's little to fault. It's got a decent next-gen feel given that people would have been coming to this from the 16-bit FIFAs of this world. Licensing the Olympics is an interesting move too, given FIFA and it's like were already rapidly starting to hoover up the more recognised ways of getting the real world into your football team. But it doesn't work. The Olympics already has a problem in that it's only a football tournament for mostly under 23 players, with each team allowed three bonus adults. It also only involves 16 teams, which, for political reasons, does not involve any of the British ones. This is sort of irrelevant, because none of the teams even have the real under-23 players either. They've added fake representations of some of the missing countries, including the British ones, but it seems pretty pointless. It does shoot one of the reasons to play this game in 2019. There are definitely still Arsenal fans playing the FIFA from the year the team didn't lose a single game, for instance, but there's no reason for Nigerian fans to play this to recreate their team's 1996 gold medal run though, because nothing's recognisable. So it's going to have to survive on its own merits as a game, against the likes of Sensible Soccer on one side and FIFA's both old and new on the other. Its best bet seems to be arcade, so let's try that. Well, the team news today, fascinating, there were so many options. Here's what the coaches decided. This is such an important game, these substitutes all disappointed they're not starting. Well, there's commentary, which is an impressive touch for such an early game. It's sparse by today's standards, and of course names fictional players, but it's there. The controls are pleasingly simple in a party shooty way. The goalies though are abysmal, but not in the way they normally are. They can save shots just fine, and I didn't find any obvious cheaty ways to score. They can't kick at all though. Most goal kicks are intercepted by the opposition before they leave the penalty area, even if you really boot them. Playing the short game and building from the back is a problem too. The passing is woolly and the game certainly doesn't reward you for trying. In comparison, making a you only live once to run straight through the defence will frequently allow you to get a shot off. There is though a pleasing physicality to the play as players pull off moves like back heels and bicycle kicks. The game does recreate the structure of the Olympic competition, but the default teams are the wrong ones for the 1996 tournament. Although as mentioned, it's not like you can properly recreate reality in the first place. Ultimately though, it's not a good football game in 2019. For arcade, you play sensible. For a little more realistic, you pick up a year-old FIFA for pocket change from CEX. It'd have value if you could properly recreate a classic tournament, but if you can't play as Ronaldo at the Olympics, there's no point to it anymore. If you're not playing on a 3DO system, What are you playing with? Presenting 3DO, the most advanced home gaming system in the universe. It's time to put away your toys. The 3DO was a near unique experiment in games consoles. Traditionally, the games industry economics were split. Computers like the Amiga were sold for a theoretically fair price, but once you had them, you were free. Anyone could publish an Amiga game or word processing package or even operating system without getting Commodore's permission to do so, with the immediately obvious good and bad consequences of that. 
Games consoles, though, had generally been sold at or even below their cost to manufacture. The likes of Sega and Nintendo made their money back by making it near impossible to release games on their system without licensing them. In Nintendo's case, they also had a monopoly on producing compatible cartridges for the machine. They made their money by overcharging for said media, and including a fee for that license. This as much as anything is why Amiga games were £25 to £30, and Mega Drive games were twice that. Of course, it's also why I paid £70 for my SNES and £300 for my Amiga at similar points in the life cycles of both formats. The 3DO company had pedigree. The founder was William Hawkins, better known as Trip, and much better known for leaving Apple in 1982 in order to found a small company called Electronic Arts. Over the nine years he was in charge, Trip built EA into the global brand we know today. In the process, transforming the default position of the games industry from kids in their bedrooms to probably still kids but in an office. I'll leave you to decide if that's an improvement. In 1991, he wanted a piece of the hardware game, having seen Sega and Nintendo launch their 16-bit offerings. He formed the 3DO company to try and be first to market with a major next-generation offering. But they weren't going to make it themselves. Instead, Trip partnered with another couple of industry veterans, Dave Needle and RJ Michael, most famous for being part of the core team that developed the Amiga. They designed a hardware specification blueprint, and the plan was that other companies would simply license this and build their own 3DOs. In return, there would still be software licensing, but the rate would be about $3 a unit, somewhere around a fifth of Nintendo's charge on a full-price game, and nearly as cheap as your mum. The 3DO was duly the first 32-bit CD console launched in most territories. Its UK release came in September 1994, just after the cartridge-based Atari Jaguar, but a full year ahead of the PlayStation, by which time the Americans had already had the 3DO for 12 months. Which is where the first trouble started. The launch 3DO was only made by Panasonic, with LG, then known as Gold Star, and Sanyo models to follow and in late 1993 the need for Panasonic to manufacture cutting-edge hardware not only at a profit, but at enough of a profit to cover the license fee, meant that the recommended retail price for a 3DO in the United States was $700. About four times the launch price of the SNES, or Mega Drive, or three Atari Jaguars. There was another problem. The specs for the machine had been fixed really, really late, and the software just wasn't ready. Plus, the 3DO company didn't have a first or second party publishing program of note. They would only publish or develop a handful of games until quite late in the console's life. In fact, the only game you could get at the US launch was the debut title of a new development company called Crystal Dynamics, now famous as the creators of every main series Tomb Raider game since Legend in 2006, including all the rebooted series. The most interesting thing about this game is the designer was Mark Cerny, formerly at Sega Technical Institute at the time they made Sonic 2, Sonic Spinball and Comic Zone, and latterly the chief hardware designer on both the PlayStation 4 and 5. In 1993 though, solo launch title was a heavy burden to carry for a fairly generic racing game by an unknown developer, and Crash and Burn, while by no means awful, was not the packing title that would sell a $700 console at all. No matter though, because the late spec finalisation and other production issues meant there weren't many to buy in the first place. Most shops had one or two units to sell, and this probably accounts for the long gap before we saw the machine in this country, by which point there were at least a lot more games. The first issue of 3DO magazine in winter 1994 reviewed a full 34 of them, although one of them was Rise of the Robots, the 3DO version, as previously documented on this show, rivalling the Amiga's version as a waste of the Earth's limited resources. It says all we probably ever need to know about this magazine, that they savaged its gameplay in the review before giving it 4 out of 5 stars. That and the fact the idiots gave the seminal and definitely more fun than Rise of the Robots Night Trap 1 star. It does illustrate even then that the software pool was shallow for the 3DO. Of the 9 games they gave 5 out of 5, all but one either came from Crystal Dynamics or Electronic Arts where Trip was still on the board. EA's lineup is particularly illuminating. FIFA, Madden, Road Rash, Theme Park. There's some innovation here though. While Theme Park is the Amiga version after a visit to the stylist, FIFA is the first 3D entry in the series, 
marking a quick transition from its old isometric view, and broadly the idea iterated on until this day. Contrast this with the Road Rash, which, while prettier, is still a 2D tunnel racer with no physics. The pick of EA's output, though, can't be faulted in that way. The ungainly named Road and Track Presents The Need for Speed. Road and Track is a long-running American magazine. The Need for Speed is indeed the first entry in a franchise that runs to this day, and might be the one genuine impact of the 3DO as a system. The pressure was already on by the time the machine and this magazine launched in the UK though. Finally, a second manufacturer had a system, Goldstar launching their incomprehensibly named GPA-101M at $400, the same price Panasonic's system had fallen to, pretty much half its launch price. And while the magazine puts a brave face on it, global first year sales of 250,000 were nowhere near what was needed. While it's a slightly unfair comparison, the PS4's first year sales were at least 50 times that. A UK one $1 pound launch price wasn't going to help either, this being the era before we all voted to surround our currency and beat it with sticks until it was worth marginally less than a Telegraph columnist's opinion. 3DO was, in reality, already looking for a get out, and this issue mentions both their ideas. Firstly, they partner with Creative, they of the Sound Blaster, in order to release a card to allow PCs to play 3DO games. In many ways, this was visionary. The groundbreaking Voodoo and GeForce graphics cards that would transform PC gaming were still a few years off. The card would allow any PC with a CD drive and a Sound Blaster sound card to play 3DO games in Windows 3.1. It worked too. Although its biggest problem was that because it contained an entire 3DO minus the CD drive, and Creative needed to make money on the thing, it cost the same $400 as Panasonic would charge you for the complete system. At a time when the PC generally still lived locked away in a study on a 14-inch monitor, it didn't fly, and the rapid implosion of the 3DO as a viable format during 1995 meant it never sold much, despite coming with two free games, and what I can only describe as this joypad. It was also bloody gigantic, as this picture from Oz Retro Gamer shows. The article in 3DO magazine includes a mention of the other Get Out. There was a second upgraded machine on the way. Despite the fact the 3DO as a standard was less than two years old, and launch supporters had shelled out a grand in today's money for it. M2, as it was called, was initially mooted as an add-on for existing 3DOs and the 3DO Blaster. But the design, again from Needle and Mikal, was too different, and it became a plan for an entire replacement. In 1995, a prototype was shown off at the very first E3 show. To contextualise this, this is also the show at which Sega surprise launched the Saturn into US stores for the same $400 you'd pay for a 3DO, and Sony did this. Sony Computer Entertainment Presidents of America, Steve Reyes, join me for a brief presentation. Two ninety nine. It's also the show where we got our first look at the Ultra sixty four, formerly known as Project Reality, and latterly known as the Nintendo sixty four. The competitors were stacking up. Trip saw the writing on the wall. While M2 was supposed to follow the same broad multi manufacturer scheme as the 3DO, in early 1996 he sold the rights to the format exclusively to Panasonic. Our feature magazine issue occurs just after the second E3 show in May 1996. M2 was a no show. Panasonic showed off four games hidden away in the corner of their stand. Studio 3DO, the by now established 3DO first party developer, was even showing off games that would come to the PC but not 3DO. Nonetheless, M2 was on track for later that year. I think you see where this is going. The PlayStation was already established in the US and UK, and was beginning its quest to take over everything. The N64 was by now out in the US and imminent in the UK. The Saturn was at least surviving and all three of these machines could now be had for under £200 by summer 1997, when Panasonic officially canned M2 as a console. By this point, 3DO magazine was of course long dead. 
The 3DO itself had been out of production for over a year. The 3DO company soldiered on until 2003, producing nothing you'll remember unless you played a lot of cookie-cutter army men games as a child. Trip retains rights to the 3DO hardware, but has so far done nothing visible with it. He founded a mobile games company called Digital Chocolate and ran that for a decade, and is now one of those generic old businessmen who sits on boards and presumably advises them to copy him in the 80s rather than the 90s. The M2 technology was used in a few arcade machines, with the intention of making home ports, a trick that worked rather well for Namco and Sony with games like Tekken. But with the absence of a home console and the reliance on a very slow CD drive, only a handful were ever made. M2 ended its life in slightly undignified fashion as the hardware behind Japanese ATMs and coffee vending machines. In a way it's a shame. The current console generation consists entirely of the two big guns of Microsoft and Sony trading punches with consoles which, hardware-wise, are very, very similar. Both use almost identical AMD Jaguar processors, and even more almost identical AMD graphics chips. Both are successful. And there's only one handheld option, the Nintendo Switch. In the so-called fifth generation of video games consoles, we had the very different PlayStation, Saturn and N64, but also the Jaguar, 3DO, Amiga CD32, and the super obscure FM Towns Marty, PCFX, Apple Bandai Pippin, Playdia, and Casio Loopy. And a total of nine handheld options, Gaming's maturity has also become its consolidation, and to even have a hope of breaking this oligopoly, a company would have to commit billions. Gaming is probably better now, but is it more interesting? I don't think so. And with that downer, we only have one bit of business left, and being a game that even the desperate 3DO magazine only gave two stars to, I don't think this is going to help. Welcome to Iron Angel of the Apocalypse, The Return. I don't know what this is, but it's got a worryingly Rise of the Robots feel to the intro, hasn't it? I'm guessing, if like me you hadn't played this game, you've probably no idea what genre the game even is. I didn't either, and I've just cut to halfway through the second intro movie and I still have no idea. It gets worse, as there's what I term fake gameplay, where you theoretically have control, but have a predestined outcome. In this case, a fatal crash that leads to them wanting to rebuild you as some kind of robot hybrid to replace the one they killed in the first game. It's an entirely original plot for your character, who I'll call Robert Cop. Oh, and then there's a third movie. Shit, a game! And it's an FPS. Of sorts. The immediate reaction is what we have here is Wolfenstein's uglier cousin. This over-the-top blood effect will disappear soon, but what we have here is a 2D game engine masquerading as 3D, but without Wolfenstein's bright colours and engaging aesthetic. I feel it's worth mentioning that by the time this game was released, we already had both Doom and Quake. And that's the end of level 1. I've shot zero things and had zero meaningful gameplay, but hey, it's time for a fourth movie. Admittedly, as we're about to discover, this is essentially an extended tutorial, but even so, this is a game built around pretty CGI movies. At least the likes of Night Trap built that into the actual game, but here it's just confusing context for later shootings. The second level is test shooting. One presumes at some point a challenge of sort might appear. And the third level is an actual level with a dude in, which gets us into the game proper. With the weird filter gone, you notice two things. Firstly, that the corridors, which are either ocean grey or military grey, are dull and samey. When combined with the lack of any landmarks, this means that you're going to get lost a lot. Secondly, that draw distance is pretty abysmal. You'd think on a machine like the 3DO that does have some genuine power, we could pull off something that ran easily on a PC from three years earlier. But the scenery, such as it is, disappears into blackness only a few metres in front of wherever the hell I am. The frame rate is at least okay, but it damn well should be. 
The aiming is a little tricky, but the enemies don't fight back much, and right from the start of the game both your energy and ammo regenerate. So if you do have a problem, it's just a matter of murdering whatever's in your immediate vicinity and then hiding for 30 seconds. Maybe reading a book about another, better game. 3DO Magazine, in a seemingly rare period of lucidity, kinda nailed it with their description. Unfortunately, the game's most deadly opponent is tedium, encouraging you to simply not care about your energy status. All the game's energy and interest is in the FMV, with gameplay reduced to a poorly thought out pause between the next Brava cinematic. They're not wrong, and such plot as there is disappears into an incompetent translation from an already traditionally confusing Japanese manga style affair. Ultimately, the whole package wasn't interesting then, and certainly isn't now. Go back and enjoy the bright colours of Wolfenstein. There's a perfectly nice version of that for the 3DO if you want to use the console. Getting constantly stuck on open doors isn't even remotely the most annoying thing going on here. CGI's pretty though. Another magazine lesson. Remember those times when a magazine would run an advert for a sister magazine? I bring this up because on our back page today is the Twitch and YouTube streaming stylings of one cat, aka Shin. If you're a Yesterzine fan, you know her well for convincingly playing the designers of Gran Turismo and Rise of the Robots, doing a flawless Scottish accent playing Stuart Campbell in the Cannon Fodder episode, and of course her greatest role doing a pitch perfect impression of popular magic dude, Teller. But, after a hard day of recording top quality acting for YouTube's number 5 most popular magazine retrospective show, you'll find Shin doing a streaming. Whether your poison is Call of Duty, Fallout, Overwatch, or just inventive swearing, it's a good time along with a fine crew including Mr. PSB, Ed the Penguin, Scorovensis, friend of the show Bloggo, and just occasionally, me. In all seriousness, I've known Shin for well over a decade now. She's good people. Mostly. And remember, it's pronounced Belonda. Links in description, YouTube sublink after the credits. And so this, the first time Yesterzine has attempted to look at every single game reviewed in an issue comes to an end. And if you want to tell us picking a magazine with two reviews is cheating, use the contact links above or a comment below. If this is your first Yesterzine, there's several more available. Perhaps find out what the fuss was with that whole Rise of the Robots running gag by watching that episode, by selecting it when the link appears at the end of the credits. And then subscribe, to find out just what a guy does when he's definitively run out of jokes about your mum. Later! <laughs>